back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and my co-host is Austin Chadwick. And today we have Giovanni Asproni uh, here to talk about uh, his uh, InfoQ article on uh, mob programming in a high-stakes environment, remote mob programming in a high-stakes environment. Um, but before we get into that, Giovanni, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Giovanni Asproni. I'm uh, Italian. Well, I was born in Italy at least, but I'm based in London. And now I'm dual national. I've been in London for 22 years. But what can I say about me? I've been programming computers since I was a teenager. So we are talking about almost 40 years. I started in VIC-20, Commodore 64, computers that are, were common in my generation. And professionally, almost 30 years, something like this. Um, I use lots of different technologies. Nowadays, I work as a consultant. And I try to promote agile practices of working. I've been doing agile since about 2001. Fantastic, fantastic, awesome. Well, uh, so the topic is uh, mob programming, remote mob programming in a high stakes environment. Uh, maybe uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, what do you mean by high stakes? So what does that cash out to mean for you? Here? Well, in this case, I can tell you, give you a, a bit of context. This was uh, some work that uh, my team and I did in COVID times for some of the systems behind the COVID app in England and Wales. You remember the COVID app that could tell you if you were in contact or were in close proximity of people that got COVID, yeah? So I was one of the tech leads of that particular application for England and Wales. And in this case, high stakes means if we made any mistakes, bugs, something that you know could be visible for the users, we would end up in the news. Uh, so at the time, the news, they're always looking for mistakes on our side. So anything even minor could end up in the first page. And this was not fun. And then, of course, the other part of the high stakes was uh, since the application uh, and, and this particular system that I, I talk about here was to help people in COVID times. That was another side of the high stakes, if you want. Yeah. So the systems had to work, had to perform in order to help people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, you're right. In this case, it's not only high publicity risk, but also high health risk, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. For, for this particular system, was I can tell you was actually a very simple one, but uh, was um, backend service that was used to uh, allow people on low income that were uh, asked by the app to uh, self isolate to apply for some money. From the government you see if somebody's on low income often gig workers so staying at home because of covid for them was a cost a big mm. cost I and see. so the english government put some money available if i think at the time it was 500 british pounds per week and this system was to allow them to apply for this money gotcha gotcha well thanks for setting that context that really that really helps a lot and uh uh, was mobbing something you as a team were doing before this particular high stakes situation, or uh, was it something you had not adopted because of the high stakes? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I didn't give you another part of the context. It was uh, so we were part of myself and the rest of the team, we were part of the same company. Mm, yeah, okay. uh, it's called uh, Zulk Engineering, a good company. I don't work for them anymore, but it's definitely a good company. Um, but we were based in different offices, okay? So these uh, Zulk has offices, various uh, countries in Europe, in Asia. Um, and so we, before working together on this particular project, we didn't even know each other or even about each other, complete strangers. So mm -hmm. the team was set up in a, in a few days uh, because there was a promise made by the ten, then prime minister to the pop uh, population for this system, so basically saying, by this date, you left the system in place. And then somebody came to me. I was already a delivery manager for the app, but then they came say, you know, you need to lead this team. Uh, these are the people. This is the timeline. Off you go do something. This was pretty much the, the mandate. So we didn't even know each other on the first day. <laughs> wow, what a situation. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, 
Yes, it's dynamic reteaming comes to mind, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so I guess what are what were some of the first moments like when the team got together? And... Uh, I can tell you, I did my the the things that I usually do. You know, I led have many teams in my career, so all I did was uh, fired up an email to everybody, basically saying hello, guys. Now <laughs> I set up a call. So um, I had a call with the team you know, a few hours after I was told that uh, I was going to leave these people. We had an initial call where we introduced each other. And, uh, well, of course, I started saying who I was <laughs> and set up some, con some context for them as well. So, you know, round of presentations and then setting up the context. And this is where we decided actually how to work. Uh, so we were short of time uh, to give you further information is some work that somebody, uh, you know, some of my colleagues estimated in about eight, 10 weeks of work, we had about four. Okay. Yeah. And since uh, was uh, the system for, you know, giving people money, but was also a system for the uh, English government, this meant that was, uh, that had several constraints. So it has to be accessible. People with disabilities have to be able to use any web application in England and UK, which means we couldn't simply go out and, you know, and use random uh, technologies or even say, well, we'll do whatever we can. And if it's not accessible for the first two weeks, you know, it's not a problem because that was just not possible. And then, of course, had to be uh, secure, as in even minor security issues were a no-no. Systems that are owned by any government are always under attack. Okay, so we had these constraints. So the first call, uh, we talked about this and we discussed about how to work. So, and I set up some context there because I said, I'd like us to pair at least, but if we mob is even better. That was pretty much the ask. Uh, I don't think the others ever tried mob before working in this particular team, but they were curious about it. So there was no real resistance. It was a kind, ah, it looks interesting. Yeah, let's try that. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So so there was, there was kind of just general acceptance and they kind of went into it and, and just tried it. Um, what, what context of mobbing did you have before all of this? Like, what, what was your, did you do it before I, or was it... Uh... So before that, I did a lot of pair programming, my career, a bit of mobbing, but never in a kind of formal way, if you like. Yeah. So it was kind of more uh, on the spot kind of thing. Guys, yeah. I need help. And then, you know, two or three, four of your colleagues show up and becomes a mob without anybody saying anything about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. This is, that's fascinating. And uh, the, what was the, maybe background or skill set of the people that so, were willing to try out mobbing in this high stake situation. <laughs> uh, so the initial team, uh, they were pretty much junior intermediate uh, wow. in terms of, in terms of year of experience. Okay? okay. In terms of skills, they were amazing people. So even if we didn't really know in full all the technologies we had to use because this was, you know, th there was like a list of things that were just there to make the situation more and more difficult. So we had to use Terraform, had very little experience with that. Some experience, but with AWS, but not enough to do everything in. And then a senior joined us a few days later. I think he was the only one uh, along with me that had some serious experience with padding and some experience with mobbing. Mm, okay. Uh, so th this was the kind of context was basically a bunch of people with a good will, you know, good skills, but somehow <laughs> in a difficult position. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess, I guess to be more specific, it was like, uh, all of you were developers. It wasn't like there was like a testing person or a security oh, no. person or, or something like that. Okay. So there yeah. were now in this, for this, for the entire system, there were because of a requirement from the government, we had a test team outside. Mm -hmm. They really did some manual testing because not because we were Q, 
keen on that is because it was a requirement. Mm-hmm. Sure. I have to say that also with those people, we had very good interactions. I mean, everybody was pretty amazing there. Security, nice. there was a security team there, uh, again, uh, from government, and they would go do full penetration testing on everything. You know, if, if there was uh, something, they would say no, and the release does not go out. Mm. Simple as that. So there were other teams. And then, of course, to learn the things that we didn't know, did not know, we had, fortunately, other people in the rest of the wider team that were available as, if you like, for us, external consultants. I can tell you we had a few, some sessions. I remember one that was 16 hours, one mob, one day, 16 hours learning Terraform with a guy that was one of our colleagues that was the expert of it. That acted like the very uh, stern teacher, you know, letting other people to do the stuff. And then an error would appear and say, ha, huh, an error, what's happening? And then people would just guess. And uh, you guess and it goes, read the message. <laughs> you know, yeah. read the message that is written there. So, you know, it was, we, we had people around that could help us at least get up to speed. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a... Uh... <laughs> I, I'm going to dive a little bit into that 16 hour mobbing session. Cause, uh, that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, a marathon. Um, h- how did you make 16 hours sustainable? Did you guys have breaks? You know, what, what, what was kind of, did, did, was that different from your normal mobbing to sustain? Uh, long? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was different. I mean, uh, yeah. we had breaks for lunch and things. And from time to time also what happened was even during the mobbing, we started to talk about something else, you know, okay. and then working again. Uh, so that was a particular occasion where we really need to get up to speed with some stuff. And, and somehow also then, I mean, the goal of what we needed to achieve was some kind of worthwhile goal, if you like. So we were putting in all we could. We had uh, also a few weekends in, yeah, to gotcha. be able to deliver. But something that we never did ever was uh, cut down on quality, cut down cor- cut corners or anything like that. In fact, we use TDD full on, full test automation, deployment automation, everything. And we leverage some of the automation for the creation of the environments and spinning them up from the other parts of the system as well. So we didn't even try to do everything ourselves from scratch. It would have been foolish. Yeah. Or for the accessibility bits, for example, we, we did something that it was for young developers was really, really unorthodox because the uh, British government has some libraries that for web development that guarantee accessibility the way they are done. But it's basically HTML pages with templating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we ended up serving HTML from the server side, which for some young developers was quite unusual. They're used to JavaScript and then API calls. Instead, we were <laughs> server side pages but this done from a lambda as well so it was kind of imagine this uh, cgi on steroids something like this (laughs) (laughs) Ah, amazingly well it worked really amazingly well because also this design actually allowed us to put some logging in uh, use the logging to uh, actually have observe proper observability of of the application as well ah nice as an aside the, our logging was structured logging no rubbish like uh, you know giovanni has been here kind of logging or anything like that yeah <laughs> proper structure was was designed let's put things this way yeah <laughs> nice nice oh wow all right yeah so um given the high stakes uh how was uh, the decision making? Um, yeah, the, as as a mob, how did that now, go? I can tell you a bit of this. Now, uh, one of the reasons, first of all, that I didn't mention yet, why we went for mobbing, why I suggested at least pairing, uh, but preferable mobbing, was because because of the high stakes, COVID time. If somebody in the team got COVID or got ill, yeah. If you are not paying or mobbing, is the knowledge is uh, you know spread less evenly, and then you have a problem. It's more mm-hmm. you are more likely to depend on individuals, and this would have been a major problem. So it's about resilience there. Then there was the learning. You know, we didn't know many of the tools, and sometimes when you have to do something alone, and you have to learn that, sometimes you get stuck. If you are with others, like in a mob, it's much easier. Yeah. 
mm. or things like bad days. I have bad days. You know, there are bad days in which I, I'm, I'm unable to produce anything. Yeah. When I'm petting or mobbing, the situation changes. Somehow I become productive. Okay. So this is part of the context. In terms of the decision making, one thing that I um, set up from the get go was how we were going to work. So uh, I made sure that everybody understood that I didn't care about, um, you know, senior, junior, whatever title you could have. It was about bringing something to the table and contributing. And everybody had the same rights as everybody else, yeah, in the team. And they could contradict me as well. You know, it's like the fact that I'm the team lead does not mean that I have all the good ideas. Yeah. So if I say something silly, <laughs> and uh, but also there was the other problem. In those kind of situations, uh, you tend to have a, an enormous amount of meetings. Mm. So what I did, I, myself, and the delivery manager that, uh, that was in our team, we paired basically. And on and the two of us went to all the meetings to leave the team do their job. Mm. Okay. And for the decision making for the design, the mandate was I trust you do your job. Yeah. I trust your decisions. I support them. I explained them what we needed to achieve with it was the core of the functionality was pretty clear. Mm. Okay. It was not rocket science, it was very clear. So the main goal was clear. And I ask them to focus on the core stuff, leave alone all gold plating or fancy stuff because there was no time. But, but also, uh, you know, any improvements like we had, for example, UX people they, that were very keen on some design things that were mostly cosmetic, yeah, more than pure usability. And my take was this stuff will will wait until a future release. Yeah, we have no time. Cut down the the whatever is not useful. Of course, if there was a usability issue and accessibility issue, that was different, yeah? So myself and the delivery manager would go to all the meetings, yeah? And then I discovered later that we actually, uh, what we are doing is also a pattern, a organizational patterns. I don't know if you came across the organizational patterns book from Cope, Gene Copeland. Mm. It's a book from several years ago. Yes. And so we are bare, we were basically acting as the firewall and gatekeeper. Okay. Right. Firewall is as in you are there, nobody goes to harass the team because they have stuff to yeah. do. And the gatekeeper is about um transferring information. Yeah, keeping the people outside the team informed about what was happening in the team and vice versa. Okay. So uh, we can, uh somehow we one of the things that we did was being able to communicate with the external world, leaving the developers to do their job. Mm. We went to the uh, also to the point of telling them, look, you hate Jira. They didn't like Jira at all. <laughs> Use whatever tool works for you. Since Jira was used internally to look to check, you know, um, progress and stuff, the delivery manager and I would do the, you know, the Jira compliance work, if you like. Copy things over. Yeah. You know, fall on the sword. <laughs> yeah, was, because you see, at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah the good team of people that knew how to do software. Now, I didn't want any random obstacles there. Yeah, that we are not really helping them to to proceed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's important. And a lot of the time, I think, you know, without the time constraint, maybe a, a mob would have automated it themselves or something along those lines right but if you have things where it's like this immediate goal you have a very tight timeline um you're, you're working crazy hours to make sure that it it gets out there with the appropriate number of features within a short amount of period of time then eliminating uh you know eliminating work for the team in any way possible is extremely important yeah Yes. Yeah, this is, I tell you, it's generally my approach. Yeah. I don't like when people start to uh, pile up features and stuff without focusing on what is important because you'll end up with a team that is stretched and the quality that suffers and customers, they actually don't have what they want or what they need. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and how was that it, more specifically? Like, so um, you, you were saying like piling up too many features how did that go in kind of the high stake situation as far as, yeah. you know, 
maybe they were asking for this and how did you decide what to deliver? You mentioned some things that were non-negotiables, but were there things that could be cut or, you know, how, how did that go with the story? The, the, the core functionality was really simple because okay. was, the reason why we were creating this system is because we needed to get the personal information of the people applying for this money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This information could not be uh, provided by the mobile app itself. Okay, because the, because the mobile app had strong constraints of privacy in terms of people cannot be tracked by using this, not even by mistake. So it's forbidden to put anything that could be personal uh, information. Yeah. So the trick for that to go to work around this was, well, saying putting a button there when people were in self isolation saying, if you want to apply for money, you know, or you may, may I can't remember all the world, but it could be like you may have the right to apply for 500 pounds self-isolation money, something like this. Push the button. Then when they push the button, there was, they would be brought to a website. We then, okay, from this point on, now we'll collect your personal information for these purposes. So they were outside the app mm -hmm. and they were informed about what was going to happen. This was why it was, you know, an external system. And from that point on, was collecting some information, yeah, with some steps, some questions to tell them you are eligible or you, you are not eligible. Yeah, so putting some criteria there. Simple. But then conversations about the number of steps, number of pages, the size of this, the color of that, you know, all sorts of random yeah. stuff. Yeah, that was, I don't care. We'll go with the simplest thing that is... We are using this framework, guarantees um, accessibility, so we are fine. We do something that simple, and any embellishments can come later. Yeah. Or we managed to eliminate some parts of the system because initially we were given an architecture that was designed by some architects in government that they designed that in, uh, in the abstract, if you like. Yeah, without deeply yeah. thinking about the problem. Okay. And so they had things like databases that could contain personal information that actually were not that useful and would cause a privacy problem to us. Stuff like this. Okay. So we simplified everything, mm. everything we could to get to the core of what we needed to do. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. And so was that 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 kind of whittling down that happened kind of in those meetings, the firewall meetings, so to speak? Um, did that happen in the mob, both? Or? Uh, well, they happened in the mob in the team. Basically, what we discussed was, this is what you need okay. to do. And then I said, don't worry about the rest. Don't worry. I, I'll take care of about <laughs> what is outside, in the world outside. <laughs> and, and part of my job also was explaining these things, yeah, explaining yeah. the risks, because we were at high risk of not delivering. You know, short timelines, lots of constraints and stuff. Obviously, when you talk risks, people don't really want to listen. They don't want to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, and then you can imagine a situation where you could be exposed. Yeah. Because we would be exposed with the prime minister and, uh, and the, the public. I can tell you that we delivered on the very last moment we possibly could. Yeah. Because we were waiting for some penetration testing to finish. They found some small issues. We fixed them. And of course, we didn't simply patch them. We put tests around that. We always did that. Uh, and so there was a call on the night before of the official delivery date with, I think, was a cutoff time of, if I remember correctly, 8 p.m. UK time. Yeah. So on that call, they had to know if we were going to deliver or not, because if we were not, then the press office of the prime minister would need to be informed because they had to craft a message to the public. I mean, <laughs> when you talk about high stakes, this is <laughs> as you can possibly go. You know, when people say a real deadline, this is the only one I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> the real deadline. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the prime minister is always wanting to know about my deliveries, you know, for my mob. So I, I don't know. It can sound out of the normal for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the funny thing is that when I went to the final meeting, there were everybody there you know, all the various quite senior people because everybody wanted this system to be out, but most people secretly thought we are not going to make it, you know, too many obstacles in the way. Yeah. yeah. So when I joined the call and I said, good news, the testing is finished, everything is good, we are 
good to go. We are delivering tomorrow. There was a big blast of, you know, people shouting in, in joy. Yeah. In the, <laughs> they yeah, couldn't amazing, really. possibly believe that. Yeah, you can say thank you for your confidence, or <laughs> it's, it's your long <laughs> but yeah, I, that's fantastic. What was was understandable? I mean, yeah. it's not. I cannot even say that. Actually, I don't know if we believed or not that we could make it. Mm. We actually worked that. We did our best to make it, but I don't know. I cannot tell you if at that time I was so confident or not. Yeah. You know, if I say that I was, it's kind of. It's like the the movies, you know, the hero that from the beginning knows everything. Why? Right? <laughs> not like that at all. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So coming down to the wire there. Um, so as you as as you know, with mobbing and pairing, uh, it's much more social. Uh, could you feel the stress? Was stress an issue? Was uh, how, how was it kind of emotional? I, I can tell you. So well, that that was interesting because you see, at the time we were all working remotely. Yeah, mm. we, we COVID, so we couldn't. And actually, working in a mob helped us to deal with the stress because we have breaks chatting about random stuff. Yeah. And so otherwise it was a kind of very lonely at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it helped us with actually with, to deal with the stress. At the beginning, that was interesting. You know, the, when they talk about the forming, norming, uh, no, forming, storming, norming, performing of the teams. Yeah. I think that all this mob was collapsed in a few hours, maybe one day or two days, max, mm -hmm. uh, without anything major. I remember that at the beginning, there were some interactions that uh, people basically would come to me and say, well, I'm having problems talking to this other teammate. What should I do? And I helped them to frame the problems in a way that was not about talking about the other person, but talking about the problem and suggested them to talk with the other person about the issue. And so they did. And so we ended up very quickly discussing any problem openly with everybody else, uh, which was pretty good. Uh, I have to say that on my part, uh, you see, one thing that I always say is uh, the things that I told them are the things that any leader, technical leader or any other kind of leader would say, yeah? Mm -hmm. about your contribution is valued, I listen to you, I can make mistakes, I'll support you, and uh, we need to have open conversations, all this sort of stuff that everybody knows. But what I did there was to show them that I meant that, yeah. which is not what I see happening very often. Mm. Everybody says the same things. Very few actually follow up with their actions. And this, I think, was super, super important. Because you see, also when we talk about self-organization and the team and things, self-organization does not happen just putting people in a room and, you know, waiting for something to happen. Yeah. Especially in situations where you, you don't have time, you need some kind of catalyst. In that situation, the tech lead is the natural catalyst, if you like. Yeah. So if you know what they are doing, they can really help the team to work as a team. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's a huge win for pairing, mobbing, or teaming is that it, there, there there is this kind of disconnect between what you say and do that has a long like uh, feedback loop or long distance in a traditional setting, right? Like, oh, I heard a leader or a tech lead say something, and I guess I'll find out over the next weeks or months if he's a person of their word or if it's just stuff they say, right? Where when you're in a pair or mob, you find out really quickly what people really mean. Like if you would have started oh, yeah, a discussion, yeah. like I believe in TDD and I believe in this, and then an hour later you're like, oh, let's forget the test and let's get it done. You know, like <laughs> you yeah. know, like you know that is the right way to do. Yeah, it. right, but right. Now, right, yeah. you know, in this particular special situation, does not apply. Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, something that I never buy ever. Yeah. So people that work with me, they know that if they come to me telling we. Mm -hmm didn't write any tests to go faster they are gonna have a hard time explaining themselves yeah yeah i have to say I, i'm not a bad guy i'm not going to shout or anything but i'll start asking questions and we start talking and then i'll prove to them that actually they didn't cut any time and yeah. they're going to spend a lot of time fixing bugs later on anyway right yeah and and uh code testability too it's uh yeah. when i see that happen often 
they go back to write the tests after the fact, after realizing the problem and then and then largely having to restructure or rewrite, you know, because they didn't test drive it. Uh, yes. So it, that, that, that's, that's typical. When you don't write yeah. the test, you know, even if you don't test drive, but if you write the test in parallel, yeah, yeah. they will influence your design because it's like, oh, damn, you know, I cannot really test this because of that. Let's refactor a bit and I'll try again. Yeah. 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 At least that. Coupling in general. And, yeah. Yeah. If, if you if you spend too much time not testing, then then tight coupling, you don't feel the pain of tight coupling as acutely. Yeah. And then... The machine will revolt against you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That kind of came up in a conversation our mob earlier today. It was kind of like, uh, or it was a conversation online, I think, that, you know, even if you're going to maybe throw away the code, I just feel like my ability to learn how to write that throwaway code <laughs> will be so much slower without tests, just because if the problem is bigger than a bread box, I'm going to get confused, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess maybe I'm not that like fraction of a percent developer who can hold a million things in their head all at once. And so as soon as that problem gets reaches that capacity, you know, it, it really helps with cognitive load under pressure and all those things that you know, that, you know, like, okay, well, we know we're good up to this point because the tests prove it. So we we just need to solve this next piece, right? And so I think TDD under pressure really makes a lot of sense, but I usually get weird reactions when I say that to, to people. <laughs> so I tell you a story that has nothing to do with this particular uh, mob episode, but it has everything to do with another team. Yeah. Working where... I found a situation where they didn't have any automated tests, only manual tests with the testers they want to do manual tests, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I said, well, enough of this. I don't want to see any of this. We'll go full automated testing. And the testers, what you do, you use your testing expertise to help with automation. Okay. But not to, to help like you write the automation yourself. Because the automation, I want the automation written by the developers with the tools they use every day because they need to be able to run all the tests when they refactor. You see, mm. a typical, typical anti-pattern is the QA, automated QA that live <laughs> in their own department. They write an automation that is basically playing catch up with whatever the developers are doing. Mm -hmm. And in one meeting talking about this, one test read what for him was a genuine question, but he didn't realize what he was talking about because he said, what if developers have no time to write the tests? And I was just waiting for some question for some question like this because uh, yeah, what if they don't have time? Say, let's see, I'm a developer. What a developer that does not write tests do? Yeah, when they write code, usually what they do is they write some code, and then they think, I need to see if it works. Yeah, I've written it, so you compile it if it is compiled language, and then you run it. To run it, you have to deploy it in some environment. Maybe, you know, your dev, uh, UAT, whatever environment, telling everybody else to stop because you have to deploy the thing. Then you run the system with a one sunny day scenario, maybe two. And then you look at it, say, I'm still unsure. So you take the code again, you add some logs that Giovanni has been here kind of logs. Yeah. Yeah, those kind of logs that actually made the fortune of Splunk and tools like that. <laughs> Uh, does pretty much the same thing, compiles, deploy, runs the same uh, scenarios, looks at the logs, yay, correct. Now I can say that I'm done. I said, so I described this scenario and I asked, uh, it was in a, in a call, say, am I correct? One brave developer said, uh, yes, this is what happened. Say, what do you call this? Do what do you call these actions of trying these things out to see, see if they work? So this is called testing. The problem is, is a kind of testing that is ad hoc and is not repeatable. And also is very shallow because you test the one, two, sunny day scenarios you're thinking of, but not a lot of the limit conditions. So you end up in a situation where you actually spend quite a lot of time to do all this testing because you have to deploy it, tell everybody else to stop, you know, and do yeah. your own thing. Uh, what makes you think that you are actually saving time? Mm. Uh, during that call, when I finished that, everybody realized what was happening. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> gosh, I never thought in these terms. <laughs> it's like, yes. 
Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's just kind of walk someone through the alternative, right? Because I think often it's thought about in isolation, but not compared to the alternatives um, and the wastes that are there in the alternatives. Um, yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, I kind of had a line of, line of thinking and question maybe for both of you on this one is, because I know this is a subject you've talked about uh, quite a bit as well, Chris, um, in that these kind of crisis ER situation, um, how sometimes or often, or maybe always, if it's handled well, it leads to kind of uh, quantum leaps in <laughs> uh, teaming and improvements and kind of cutting the stuff that doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah. How, <laughs> when does crisis help and when doesn't help? Uh, maybe I'll turn it over to both of you, but maybe we'll start with you, Gianni, uh, Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, I think that the crisis help if it is real. Okay. Yeah. So it's a situation where everybody has an interest in actually solving the crisis. Everybody, including, you know, senior execs. Okay. The problem is when the crisis is not real at all. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so in practice, the only people that feel the crisis are the ones trying to solve it, you know, the developers and everybody else. Well, you know, typical scenarios I've seen in investment banks sometimes when I work there. Ah, we need to have this deadline because otherwise, bah, bah, bah. When everybody knew that was not the case. Yeah, totally artificial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so I totally agree. Um, you know, there, there was a point where uh, I was working with a military con contractor, environmental chemistry uh, sort of thing. And, you know, there were, cri there were there were artificial crises and then there were like real crises, right? So like, the artificial stuff was, you know, everybody estimated a deadline out and we're not going to hit it because, you know, uh, the the estimates were wrong. And then and then there was like the real crisis uh, uh, where, you know, we had we had somebody from the military say, we need this and we need it yesterday and we 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 will do anything to have it right now. And and it. it led to you know considerable things where you know people were uh you know commuting two hours a day just to like be with the team from the military organization or uh you know um removing every impediment there weren't you know there was like it, it went from you know a year and a half for a delivery to daily deliveries and it was a quantum shift uh and, and similarly when mobbing started um, with, with our team, it was, it was like, we have this tax deadline, there'll be big fines and problems if we don't meet that tax deadline. Um, and we need, we need to have it happen on at this time. And this will not happen with the developer that's been working on it for the last year and a half or whatever. And we all got together and started mobbing. And then we worked that way from then on because it was so effective. And so, you know, I think, uh, that, that quantum leap is, is, available only in in the case of like a real emergency and not not something that was obviously um obviously happened because of bad choices earlier right yeah <laughs> yeah 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 and I, I guess my follow-up question is if the if a real crisis <laughs> can be used for good right to kind of uh you know, slim it down to the essence of the fundamentals of good software development. Um, is there a way to channel that to non-crisis situations <laughs> or would it just be perceived as artificial? Like, is, is that the, the kind of uh, the magic that you can't, you can't translate? Like, <laughs> I, I think that is a way, uh, but is is uh, uh, complicated, not because of uh, the crisis, but because of uh, people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, people tend to work in ways they're used to. Yeah. Yeah. And for them, what for me is madness for them is normal life is how, how things are. Yeah. 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 So for me, for example, uh, teams that work with PR, pull requests, emergency requests, for me is madness because they wait one day, two days, one week, one month for for a review. So yeah. what was that? Yeah. And, and when I talk with those teams, for many of them, it's just the way things are. It's not that they are particularly worried. Yeah. Uh, what I found is that 
to change that, you may need a small crisis of sort. So one of my teams, I have got a company with a partner and they created a system where there were lots of problems, bugs and things, and the customer was really upset. Then I am the CTO in that company, stepped in and asked what, what was going on here and discovered that they decided to uh, not write many tests, but to go faster, all sorts of rubbish we already discussed. And then we are working solo. And then I said, okay, now what you do is you start mobbing, okay? And you write automated tests, but don't go and try to write tests everywhere, you know, right now. Write the tests in the code you are changing now. Yeah. yeah, in the new code, start mobbing on pairing, give it a go and see. Interestingly, they, you know, the CTO says that, so we'll try it, <laughs> kind of thing. But then the response was, after a while, they actually realized the effects. They noticed that they produce much better quality, much faster. Okay, so it, it, I, I was in a position of power where I could tell people, do this, yeah? They did, and they say, oh, you know, look, actually works. <laughs> How odd. Yeah, and, and that's, go ahead, Chris, yeah. I was going to say that that was kind of, you know, I gave a talk a long time ago where it was like, don't wait for an emergency to break the status quo, right? It's like that ex experimentation. I think that boils down to the virtuous loop too. It's like, if your retrospectives have superficial action items or you don't do retrospectives at all, like you'll never, you'll never break you know and, and you can't you know I, I think like a lot of scrum teams out there just say like they, they believe that nothing in scrum is modifiable and so the retrospectives never change the length of a sprint and they never change the you know the purpose of a burn down chart and and, and so you know I, I think a lot of people get stuck in a, a status quo and and just like Giovanni is saying is the you know, that status quo just asserts itself until something, yeah. you know, breaks it out. Now, now that you mentioned Scrum, you see, yeah. one thing that I find interesting is that Scrum, you know, it can work, okay? Yeah. Depends, but like everything else, depends on the context, yeah? Mm -hmm. the, the, the funny thing is, like, in Scrum, there are some practices, some roles, some things, and if you miss those, you are not doing Scrum, they say. So they say you need to improve, but if you don't do this, it's not Scrum. And people sometimes get worried about that. My take is, I mean, if it works for me if it, and it's not Scrum, who cares? My What I need to do is something that works in my context. Doesn't have to be Scrum by the book or anything else by the book. Has to be that works in my context. In fact, it's much better if whatever methodology you are using is born out to, of your needs. Yeah. yeah? yeah. And then tuned like, uh, around what you need and, and usually changes as well, depending on which phase, if you like, of, of the lifetime of your system of you are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, I definitely, uh, yeah, that's definitely like, you, like you've talked about in the article, like having the team have the autonomy to choose what works is, is so important um, in that situation. And I think I have one more follow-up time and then we might be getting uh, close to the end of our time box here is, this might feel a little cavalier and uncaring, but I found myself having these thoughts and I'm, I'm wondering is this kind of what, what is it, maybe it was what either of you were saying a little bit, but does non XP or non good ways of software engineering naturally lead to crisis? And if so, do you just wait for the crisis <laughs> and then coach <laughs> versus trying to persuade when they're not open and they're stuck in their status quo? I, I, I like this question. So yeah. <laughs> I I try to avoid the crisis, okay. but it all depends on the people you have in front of you. Okay. So uh, sometimes people to learn, they need some context. Mm -hmm. And sometimes going against the wall head first at high speed is just the context you need. Mm. because they try something, say, bang, oh, damn, that was painful. And this, okay, now you are ready to understand why you want to try things in a different way. Because when that context is missing, the conversations can be really difficult, can be really difficult to understand things. You see, mm -hmm. how can you explain someone that has never paired, uh, paired or mobbed that you can actually go faster than splitting work among people? Mm. Explain that, that those people being the same team and working on the same system have to synchronize all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Explaining them the pull requests actually 
the peer reviews don't really find bugs as you think they do, especially because people tend to, you know, do a pull request with the thousands of lines and files mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. But th there are some things that are intuitively right. If you split work, yeah, it, they will go faster as if they were picking potatoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like you buy the land in, uh, for people and they go faster. But even with that, if you put too many people, they will start stepping into each other's toes. Yeah. So there is always a limit. But, uh, but it's very counterintuitive to many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the... Um... I, so I think that uh, uh, kind of going back to the uh, being prepared for crisis or or just waiting for the crisis in general, um, I think there's a question of sustainability there too, uh, right? And so um, a, a lot of the times you want to be out of crisis to then be capable of dealing with crisis, right? Uh, because if it's one crisis after another, then the team would get worn down anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then uh you know there there is like uh, so I, I was recently reading um uh, great by choice from jim collins and they talk a lot about uh people that have done well you know companies that have done well in in an abundance of chaos and uh they talk about this concept of productive paranoia um and so you know lean to me like is productive paranoia around like waste right it's just like oh is this like really wasting our time is that what really waste? um and and so uh you know i think a preparedness for a crisis to happen um is you know how do you storm and form and norm quickly or have the verbal context of what mob programming or and pair programming is and and you know so some of it is just like these things can can come up and interrupt us in the future and so let's not let them get in the way now and so um so i, I thought that was a good book when looking at things in terms of uh being successful in crisis mode often and and frequently and and i think some of that is a little bit of productive paranoia right because there's unproductive paranoia too but anyway, i'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation, just a quite a invigorating uh, subject, you know, and hearing about that story. And it's led to a lot of great conversations. Really appreciate that. Is there anything you'd like to share before we close? I might. No, I don't think I have anything special to share. I don't have anything to promote. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, well, we'll get some contact information for you. Uh, and put it in the show notes. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, to, for people to learn more from you if they like. And so, uh, yeah, please to our audience, please like and subscribe. Please share this episode. Uh, if, any, if you know anybody out there facing some high stake situations and uh, maybe this is uh, worthy of experimentation for them. So uh, please share it with them. And uh, yeah, until next time, mob on everyone and have a good one. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.